Uh, my name is Mia, um, and I'm joined by my co-admins, uh, John and John. Um, and I'm just going to mute you all for the duration of this presentation, just so uh, Matt can uh, present with no mm -hmm. interruption or disruption or anything like that. Um, so I'm going to toggle you guys for now, and then at the very end of the presentation, I will unmute you all, and we'll have some time uh, for questions, and that'll uh, kind of be in order of when you raise your hand. Um, so I'm just going to mute you all for now. And so uh, welcome, everybody, to this week's featured speaker event. Um, I'm really pleased to introduce Matt. Uh, Matt is a really cool guy. Uh, he's doing a lot of great things in the field. Um, Matt is currently the CEO of the award-winning spatial computing company, Doghead Simulations, um, and they've also created the VR education and training platform, Roomy. I've tried it out. I think it's really cool. Um, I recommend taking a look at it. Um, he also impressively works with the U.S. Department of Defense and on the American Association for Precision Medicine's Coronavirus Task Force, a real mouthful, um, and respectively with those two, he helps use spatial computing to help develop solutions for war fighters for the first and for solutions against COVID-19 for the second. Um, and uh, from what I know about Matt, his main goal is really to make education um, online as well really accessible and affordable to everybody. Um, so join me with a round of applause in welcoming Matt. And Matt, I think you should just be able to I don't think it needed you. Okay, great. Can everyone hear perfect. me okay? Or can, perfect. Perfect. All right, awesome. Hey, everybody. Thanks for uh, for attending. Really appreciate it. I um, try to, to friend as much people as possible in here, but please, please feel free to send me a friend request. I'm, I'm pretty accessible. Um, and, uh, yeah, happy to connect with everyone. Really appreciate everyone being here. Um, thank you so much, Mia, for for inviting me and John for organizing this. I don't know if you know, but me and John, uh, let me see, this John over here, the bald John and the hoodie, <laughs> um, are uh, really, really um, active members of the XR community and uh, total class acts. And just really, uh, you'll pr probably see them in pretty much every event um, <laughs> that you could be at. So appreciate you organizing this. All right, so let's get started. So just so everyone knows, my headset my I, I might be looking up a little bit just because i've got my hmd uh sitting just above my eyeglasses so that i can see my notes <laughs> as i present because i'm i'll be presenting from my my phone here so welcome everyone uh appreciate you joining me so so this is going to be kind of like a fun casual talk today um just around uh me who i am why should you care um my company kind of what I do with with VR and also I'm going to presenting be presenting to you my very casual but fun argument for why we are all living in a simulated mixed reality and uh, I'm going to use Nicolas Cage to prove that <laughs> so thanks for uh, giving us your time on a Saturday and uh, let's get started all right so thank you Mia for that introduction she pretty much covered all of this but this is kind of like that who I am, my wife, and you care. Uh, Mia covered all this, so I don't think I need to cover any of it. The only thing uh, that she didn't cover was um, I have recently completed a book on the metaverse and, and humanity's emergence in the metaverse uh, titled The First Person, um, and it's going to be coming out summer 2020, so be looking for that. And if any of you would like a signed copy, just hit me up or send me a message here, and we'll, we'll see if we can make that happen. All right, let's see if it switches slides here. Okay, so I literally went from fat to fit by working out in VR. Um, if that doesn't prove we're living in a simulation, I don't actually know what does, <laughs> but I used VR to lose uh, 15 pounds um, just by do working out in VR. In fact, I've got to work out tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Um, I used to do them at 4.30 a.m. PST, and uh, virtually no one would join because <laughs> it was just too early. So I've got to work out tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Uh, Shane Holt is going to be joining me. So if anyone wants to join, hit me up. Um, I'm living proof that VR workouts actually work out. So um, 
kind of something fun I've been doing for my own myself. And I, I do it every day uh, now that we're all living in quarantine. All right. So most people will argue that we are actually not living in a simulated mixed reality because it hurts when I pinch you. Or there's something called the screen door effect. I don't know if any of you are familiar with this, but screen door effect is, you know, in VR, I feel like I'm looking through a screen door. Um, and that's actually, uh, you know, just this arguments for uh, against simulation. Well, as CEO of a spatial computing company, I literally make my living creating immersive experiences that trick your brain and your body into believing that something is real when in fact it's a lie. So who's to say that we're actually not already living in a simulation? Um, I believe we are, and I can support my thesis thusly. All right, so I don't know if you all remember this debate going around, but in 2015, um, this image of this ridiculous blue and gold dress went viral on the internet. And it actually made people go bananas debating about whether or not they saw a blue or a gold dress. When in fact, you can see that there is an actual blue dress and an actual gold dress. There actually never was a blue or a gold dress. There was a blue and a gold dress. What happened was it just proved that your brain <clears throat> perceived reality and created a simulation that tricked you into thinking you saw something that actually wasn't there. And that was simply due to the suggestion that the blue dress was either blue or gold, or that the gold dress was either blue or gold. So it tricked your brain into seeing something that may or may not have been there. Here's another one. I believe this is the best evidence <laughs> that we're living in a simulated mixed reality. Um, it's the perfect example of perception versus reality. Let me get out of the way of the screen here so you can see it a little bit. Nicolas Cage is both a good and a bad actor at the exact same time. So this, <laughs> I believe, makes Nicolas Cage a quantum superposition. Uh, so if you're not familiar with a, what a quantum superposition is, uh, it's a fundamental principle of the quantum mechanics. And it states that any two or more quantum states can be added together or superposed, and the result will be another valid quantum state. Hence, Nicolas Cage can be both a good and a bad actor. I mean, come on, the guy is in award-winning films like Raising Arizona, Leaving Las Vegas, and equally horrid films, but pretty fun, like Con Air and Face Off. I mean, literally there's a movie about take, changing your face and being, <laughs> being able to take the face of someone else and put it on you. Um, and I, I think that Face Off machine actually takes quarters, but I, I can't be sure about that. All right. So let's examine uh, something else. I'm, I'm gonna move on to something that I believe is a really good irrefutable example for the simulation argument, and that is the metaverse. All right. Over the past four years, uh, I've been running a VR company, as, as you know, and I've come to realize that we are all part of an emergent paradigm that is fundamentally changing the world as we know it. It may even change reality as we currently understand it to be, which may not be what we believe it to be. <laughs> so I know that's strange, uh, but, but, but please, please bear with me. Um, so who is to say what is real and what is perception, right? So I can see each of you in this room right now. Uh, I can click your avatars and I can interact with you. And, and it feels like we're all in the same space, but none of us are actually in the same space at the same time. <clears throat> but we are, and then we aren't. So <laughs> it's a strange thing to, to realize, but I think we're all seeing it happen right now. So what we're experiencing is the metaverse. Um, and if you're not familiar with, I guess, the term metaverse, let me just explain it real quick. It's a collection of shared virtual spaces uh, constructed by the confluence of physical reality and simulated reality. So it's pretty much what we're experiencing right now. And it is uh, effectively the confluence uh, of 
uh, augmented reality, mixed reality, artificial intelligence, and like other aggregate internet technologies. And, and what the metaverse does is it uses all of this to trick our brains into believing that lies are actually true. So since starting my company, here's some images of, uh, that kind of show the last four years of what we've been doing. And since starting my company, I've, I've really been thoroughly impressed by the transparent sharing of ideas and conferences like this, uh, knowledge transfer, um, the sharing of emotions in ways that, that we've never really before experienced until now. And it's led me to consider the impact of what we're creating. And it's actually caused me to ponder something important. It, it, it's caused me to, to think about what is real, what is virtual, uh, and what is creation really. So that creation being like the cosmos, uh, the metaverse, and all of the human beings and av avatars that inhabit these spaces. So I know that these notions seem strange, <laughs> but think about this. We are all, like each one of us as XR creators in this room, we are all creating virtual worlds that are not bound by Newtonian laws of physics. Um, and if you're not familiar with, with Newton's laws, let me just kind of run down them real quick. So if you look over here on the left-hand side, we'll go from left to right. So law number one states that uh, an object in motion stays in motion, right? An object at rest stays at rest unless acted upon by some force. And if we look at law two here in the middle, uh, this simply states that force equals mass times acceleration. It's pretty simple. Um, I'm sure you've probably all learned about this in high school. Um, and then law three is for every action, there is an equal and opposite action. But in the metaverse, these laws can apply or they cannot apply. It really depends on what we want the experience to be like. We can force them to apply or we can simply break them. So if you're familiar with the movie The Matrix, um, I know that I think there's like a, a fourth movie coming out soon. They'll probably release it to a streaming service because I'm sure we'll all still be in quarantine by then. But in the first movie, there was this little monkey and he was showing Neo a spoon. And he said to Neo, there is no spoon. And what that, what he was trying to convey is that what you perceive in the real world may not exist, just like it does not exist in the virtual world. So I can pinch you and it'll hurt, right? But does it actually hurt? I mean, were you actually pinched? Or did you just experience a collision point that was programmed into the simulation? Something to consider. So I'm not sure if everyone's familiar with this, but I'm gonna be introducing these ideas and we can talk about them afterwards. So let's put, take a look at something called the Anthropic Principle. Um, if you're not familiar with that, it's something that was first postulated by a guy named Nick Bostrom. And Nick Bostrom is a Swedish philosopher working out of Oxford University who popularized the idea that we are all actually living in a computer simulation. And he developed these equations through mathematics proving this fact, right? Make sure my volume's on, okay, good. So for me, as CEO of a spatial computing company, uh, literally, spending my life and, and, and putting food on the table and paying my bills by creating virtual worlds that immerse someone so completely that they forget about the real world around them. The anthropic principle actually really gives me pause and I, and I came across it while I was building this company. So this, this principle, the anthropic principle, led to the development of the Bostrom equation. And the Bostrom equation equips us with a relatively credible quantification of simulation probability. This is important because math is an undeniable truth that helps us explain the universe in ways that we might not be able to do otherwise. Um, so in Nick Bostrom's anthropic principle, he postulates that in order for the universe to exist, so think about the real world around you, right? In order for the universe to exist as we currently know it to exist, it must first be compatible with the conscious intelligence of the entity that observes it. So that entity is us, uh, humanity. And when, when, when immersed in the metaverse, we observe a reality that is entirely virtual. 
and we almost immediately cognitively process that virtual reality as actual reality. And if, you're, if you've ever stayed in a, in a session like this um, for, for any period of time longer than probably 20 minutes, your brain just cogitates that, hey, I'm, I'm here. I'm looking to my right and my left, and I, and I feel like people are at my right and my left, and, and, but they're not. So who's to say in the real world that's not also the case, right? So when, the interesting part about that is that all of these, these kind of actions, these states, there are observer moments. And, and we have these observer moments that make us real or perceive something as reality, whether in base reality or the metaverse. So this, these are important points because these, these impact how we perceive our own natural laws of reality and whether or not they are in fact real <laughs> and natural. So if we're living in a mixed reality computer simulation, then these two questions immediately form, right? Who turned it on? So who created it, right? And can and or will it be turned off? Um, so there's, there's a lot of other questions that arise in this type of proposal, but these two are pretty difficult to avoid. So let's take the first one here, right? Regarding the, the, the question of creator. Um, I, I would not only encourage you to seek answers in, like on who turned it on, like in science and mathematics, but also seek those answers in religion. Because all of those, those items, they're all very important cogitations of our present reality. They all need to be examined together and actually with equal weight. Uh, not doing so is, is, is a pretty good path to misunderstanding. And in fact, it actually won't help you arrive at any objective truth. So you need to consider all of those and, and measure them with as equal weight as possible. And let's look at the second question here, right? Like when will it be turned off? Let me get out of the way. Um, so regarding the question of cancellation. You know, I, I'm sure a lot of you would have the fear that life can and will be turned off at any moment. But think about this. Such a fear uh, is almost not worthy of being a fear. I mean, it, don't let it entangle you in some laissez-faire approach to life, right? Um, we all know that life is a very precious gift that is turned off at every moment simply because we die. And none of us actually know when that might happen, right? It could happen at any time. So such a fear on when will it be turned off, it's just unsound. So let me get out of the way so you can see that quote. Um, as Mahatma Gandhi said, live as if you were to die tomorrow and learn as if you were to live forever. What this means is regarding the two previous question, even if we are just part of some computer simulation or mixed reality simulation, that should not preclude us from doing something useful with our lives, or at least our time in this simulation. All right, so, so this is kind of big, so let me get out of here. So studying all of this leads us to an understanding of what, that our ideas of what is real and what is virtual are actually not quite so independent. Um, one method to challenge this, and I would enc encourage everyone in this room to challenge this, is to calculate the cosmological content, uh, uh, constant, right? Or, or actually it's equivalent, um, which would be something, I don't know, that I've been calling the, the metalogical constant, uh, constant. So calculating like what is the cosmological constant of the metaverse? Um, so what is the metalogical constant perhaps? So the, if you're not familiar with what the cosmological constant is, um, let me explain it real quick. So it's a constant that arise, uh, arises in Albert Einstein's equations of general relativity. And if, if you look at this equation, the cosmological constant um, is denoted by the symbol lambda here in the middle in red. I'm not sure if it's showing up too well on, on the blue background, but um, it's the energy, the energy density of space. And it's through these equations that we can learn that our actual universe is expanding, not contracting. So what about the metaverse, right? Um, is, it, is it also expanding? Uh, are, are we creating right now a digital cosmos? Has someone else already created a digital cosmos? I mean, who's to say kind of what is real and what is not? So while there's right now, there's kind of more questions than answers on this. Um, I would say that it is through these understandings or misunderstandings that we can ponder our place 
in the metaverse and our place in the universe. But in order to ponder these questions effectively, let me, let me give you each an exercise. So, um, and this is something that you can all do right now. You can do it after this, you can do it at home, you can do it uh, out in nature, you can literally do it anywhere. <laughs> it's, it's a pretty interesting thing. So if you measure the circumference of any circle, so like the roundness of any circle, it could be a plate, it can be a tree stump, it can be Stonehenge, <laughs> it can literally be anything. And then you also measure the diameter of that circle or the width across that circle. If you divide those two numbers, you will always get pi or, or something pretty close to 3.14. It does not matter what circle you're actually measuring. That is profound. Now you might get 3.2 something, 3.18. It just kind of depends on how accurate your measurement is. But if your accurate is, you can relatively, if your measurement is relatively accurate, you will always get pi. That's pretty effing strange. <laughs> so I think this shows that math is literally everywhere. It's all around us. It's, I mean, if you think about it, mathematics is the universal law of all nature. And when you think about programming, what is programming? It's mathematics, right? So we as human beings are the physical embodiment of math. So who's to say we are not also just a program? So let me give you this. This guy is a pretty interesting guy. He, he's a very unique and interesting character and someone I, all, I, I would encourage everyone to look up. Uh, his name is Dr. James Gates. He's, he's an, uh, an MIT alumni and he's currently working as a professor of physics at the University of Maryland. And what he does is he works on equations that describe the fundamental operations of nature. So given his credibility, I think we can say he's with, with a relatively high degree of con confidence that this dude is not crazy, right? <laughs> he's very credible and he's not crazy. Um, and he recently publicly stated that he identified what appear to be actual computer code embedded in the equations of string theory that describe the fundamental particles of our universe. And what he found is quite compelling. He found error correcting code. So things like 400 code, 404, a 500 error correcting code. He found these codes that make web browsers work when he was studying the equations about quarks and electrons and supersymmetry. And he, he continues declaring like, hey, we actually might be living in a computer simulation and I think I just proved it through mathematics. So he's been, he kind of shifted his work in studying um, you know, these equations that describe our universe into really investigating this error correction code um, in, in block stream. So that was, that was something that really gave me pause. And it made me think about this quote from Albert Einstein actually, who said that God doesn't roll dice with the universe. And, and what Einstein was trying to, to do is he wasn't making a religious argument here. He was just emphasizing that our universe is governed by mathematics. So there are rules to life, right? You measure the diameter and the circumference of a circle, you divide those, you get pi. Um, and you can find this kind of stuff everywhere. What Einstein was saying is that the universe is deterministic and measurable. And so is the metaverse, right? We can measure this stuff. So is our mixed reality. So let me leave you with this. <laughs> How is it that Nicolas Cage can be both an award-winning actor in deeply dramatic and award-winning movies about our actual reality and also be an equally and profoundly bad actor in corny vampire movies, right? I believe Nicolas Cage is irrefutable proof that we are living in a computer simulation. I think only a programmer could come up with Nicolas Cage and Anthony Weiner, <laughs> all these other people. So that's it, that's my talk. Um, I wanna open up for questions and I just wanna give you like something fun to think about uh, on a Saturday afternoon. All right, what questions have you got? Awesome, thanks Matt. Hey, Matt. Um, I'm gonna open up the floor to questions here. So just so you know really quickly, what we typically do at XR Creators is the presenter does their presentation. Um, we 
give people the opportunity in sort of a um, controlled way to um, ask questions. And then after we're kind of done with that, we open up the floor and people can kind of mingle and talk with um, Matt or whoever. Um, we'd like to um, also after the um, after the questions have people come up on stage and we'll get a quick snapshot of everyone too. Um, so you should see a raise hand uh, button down in your uh, right hand side of your screen. Um, if you go ahead and click that, we'll um, pick you and then we'll give you the floor and you have to accept the floor and then you can go ahead and ask your question. Um, and then one other really quick thing before we get going, um, we definitely have to thank Matt very much for showing up today. Um, he is truly a pretty genuine person and very kind and um, and we totally appreciate him being here. So. Yeah, you bet. Uh, thanks, man. Thanks. I appreciate you saying that. Thanks, Maria, too. Um, yeah, it's it's fun. I'm glad you asked me to be here. Yeah, thank you. So, Caitlin, thanks for showing up. I'm going to give you the megaphone. Go ahead and ask your question. All right. Can you hear me? Is it good? Yes. Yes. All right. Hey, Caitlin. Awesome. Hi, Matt. We were just talking on Twitter. Um, I wish I could show up with you and Kane for that workout tomorrow. That sounds like it's awesome. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, you raised so many really awesome questions, and I just wanted to ask you, um, well, there's so much. I mean, we're going to have a talk sometime after this, but I was curious about maybe which came first, like which led to you working with Rumi, you know, just a little bit of the Rumi rundown. And um, yeah. in, in terms of our physical bodies, I know you do a lot of exercise. Do you have any of these meta thoughts as you're working out, like do you see your physical body is kind of connecting to your um, VR avatar in different ways? So um, just thanks a lot and thanks to John and Mia too. Yeah, you bet. So thank you for asking me. So I'm gonna take uh, former to latter, so your question. So what led to Rumi is, I don't know if a lot of you know this, but I grew up in extreme poverty. So I, I grew up in America, which, which which is crazy because I, I grew up in such a a poverty-stricken environment. I, I couldn't afford college. Um, so uh, I really wanted to go to college. I mean, I kind of knew I was always probably smart enough to go to college, <laughs> but but I, I just couldn't afford it. It just wasn't in the cards. So um, what I did in 1994, instead of going, I graduated high school in 1990 and couldn't afford college, had a high school degree, and I remember being really depressed. I was like, fuck, I, I, I know I'm smart, but I have the skills to only do like manual labor work. Like I can't really do much else, but I, I want to do something else, but I can't go hundreds of thousands of dollars into debt to get a degree and I can't get student loans. And it was just a, a bad situation. So I worked in very tough manual labor jobs at the warehouses and factories. I worked with a lot of ex cons. I worked with a lot of really good people too, who are still friends of mine to this day, actually. But um, it was tough. So I did that for four and a half years. And, and in that time, I actually uh, taught myself how to program computers. I was always kind of a nerd, even though I, I grew up in South Central Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, the good thing about me is that the gangs didn't want me. I was too much of a nerd. And I was like, that's, that's fine with me. <laughs> no, no problem. So, so I taught myself how to program computers. And in 1994, I started a website development company. And we didn't do anything special. We just built websites. But nobody really knew what the internet was back then, although they were starting to find out. And three and a half years later, we had a $63 million IPO, uh, which was nice. And that was in 1997. And I've been doing that ever since then. Uh, and I eventually went to college years, decades later, when I could afford to pay for it myself. Um, I, I got a degree in counterintelligence from a military university. I went to Rutgers Business School, uh, and I got a degree in marketing, and then I went to Harvard Business School after that, and I studied mergers and acquisitions there. But the reason I did all of this, and the reason I've been starting all these companies, is because it's very important to me to give back, and that led to Rumi. The reason we started Rumi is because I am on a mission, my life's mission, to truly bring high quality education to any human being on earth that wants it for the price of a monthly subscription service. So think $14.99, right? Um, I, and I, the reason I came to that price, there, there were a lot of reasons why I came to that price. We calculated customer acquisition costs, but 
I came to that price because in 1990, I remember spending $15 a week to, on food. And I was like, look, if I can go to Taco Bell and eat, 15, eat for $15 in seven days, if I could have afforded it back then when I didn't have anything to my name, someone else in the world can spend that $15 on very high quality education. And I want, I wanted to bring that to the world. So, so it's a very personal story, it's important to me. That's kind of what led to Rooney. Um, <clears throat> the, the, the second part of that from what I learned in, by working out um, is something quite interesting. So two things, number one, uh, workouts, VR workouts absolutely work out. Like I'm absolute living proof of, of that. Um, and really it just comes down to like, hey, if you want something, you just put one foot in front of the other and, and you work for it. But uh, the other thing I learned is if you're not doing yoga, you're just wrong. Right? Like you, everybody should be doing yoga because I'm 47 and it's a very important part of my workout routine. And uh, it's improved my mindset, my flexibility. I've become a much calmer person. I don't stress out so much. And uh, it's actually helped me improve physically. Um, so anyway, some, some detailed, yeah, high level uh, responses to that question. Awesome, thanks Matt. Mm -hmm. So our next question comes from Josh. Hello, hello. Hey Matt, what's up? Josh Wilcox, your favorite reality tester from Seattle. Hey Josh, how you doing man? <laughs> good, good, thanks for coming in here. Yeah, this is legit. Um, so I love uh, philosophy and math and um, I'm glad to hear about how all those apply to the metaverse. What I'm curious about is where do you see um, between what, what I'm kind of calling like base reality or like what we think of as real life and VR, where do you think meditation and art fit into that and how that could possibly change the equation for basically like um, people's own self-awareness and, and how much education they have access to? Thanks, bro. Yeah, good question, man. Thanks, uh, thanks for being here, man. Um, so I will say this. Uh, the world needs more artists, for sure, right? Um, I, I, don't, I don't like the, the distinction between, hey, I'm a creative or I'm a technical. Like, we are all creative. We are all technical in our own right. Some more than others, you know. But, uh, you know, the world absolutely needs more artists. Um, I, I believe that uh, this metaverse, you know, if you're trying to um, build something creative in the metaverse, you are not bound by really anything other than your own imagination. The reason for that is because this is just a computer simulated environment, right? If you think it, you can create it and, and you can absolutely make it a reality. Um, and, and I can go on to, I could talk about this specific topic for a while, going on to talk about how, you know, uh, we're all creative numbers, regarding what you said about math, how numbers underpin pretty much everything, even mathematics. Um, and, and I will get carried away in that. So let me just stop myself and, and say this. If you've ever looked at a Jackson Pollock painting, right? I don't know if everyone here knows who Jackson Pollock is, but you can look him up. Um, really interesting guy, very, very talented artist. And he's the guy who, who everyone believes is the dude who just kind of like uh, like spritz, splattered paint on giant canvases in his farmhouse in, I think it was in upstate New York. Um, and he developed these really incredible, really beautiful paintings just by, by, by splattering paint on canvas. And he was actually derided in, by the art world initially as a hack. And all he's doing is he's not creating, he's just splattering paint. But that didn't last long. I mean, it, almost immediately after those criticisms, he was lauded as one of the most important artists of our time. And when you look at his paintings, um, we've now got physicists, cosmologists, mathematicians studying his paintings because what his paintings show are fractal patterns. So if you think of like a Mandelbrot set, like what is a Mandelbrot set? You show these infinitely repeating patterns and you find these 
infinitely repeating patterns in Jackson Pollock's art. And he said he created his art, number one, he was pissed drunk when he created his art. <laughs> so he created his art either high or drunk, but really what he entered into was a meditative state. And he said that he didn't think, he did it without thinking. And it's something that the Japanese warrior culture, the samurai, called mushin no shin, which means without conscious thought. When you get to a place in your life, which is why I say everyone should be doing yoga or at least meditating somehow. When you get to a place in your life where you can just act without consciously thinking about that action, you will create something truly beautiful and important to the world. So I hope that answered your question. Awesome, thank you. So two more questions, one from the audience and one from the, uh, three more questions. And then we'll open things up and uh, get a photo and kind of mingle and stuff. So the first person is EM2211. If you have a question, you have to accept the megaphone. You're up. Hello? We can hear you. Or not? Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Well, when we mingle, you can ask your question. Last, uh, next to last question is Todd. Todd has a question every single event. He showed, I think Todd, Todd has been to every single one of our events. <laughs> well, I think, awesome. I think we Todd love, is we like, love Todd. <laughs> he's an XR groupie, I think, because oh, I think he's I been to every it. single one. He, he's an OG. <laughs> XR OG, I love it. <laughs> hey, Matt, great presentation. Uh, Thanks, man. A lot of uh, food for thought. So going back to the to the Matrix, which I which I really really love. Um, in the series, though, um, you see how you know people jack into the Matrix and they download stuff and then they can immediately apply it. Um, now in today's day and age, we are learning at such an incredible rate that there's so much to learn. You could put our head above water. So I'm curious in your uh, company and in your system that you've created and designed. Is there any thought to giving to, you know, how can you either compress or radically encode information, multimedia style to decrease the time it takes to um, absorb that content? Yeah, so I think it's a great, great question, man. Um, I, I, I would say that we are quite a ways off um, from making that anything real. I mean, if you look at artificial intelligence, we can most certainly integrate uh, AI into our XR experiences. Um, but artificial intelligence is too artificial right now. We are definitely approaching that reality. Um, but let me just say it this way. Get, let, let's think about it this way. Given the dramatic epoch of artificial intelligence, there, it's not yet, not now, but there will soon be a time when there is a me in base reality and another me in simulated reality. So if you think about it this way, um, I think this is going to happen before that happens, what, what you said. Um, and I could be wrong about this, but I don't, I mean, when I look into my crystal ball, it's kind of hard to tell. But if you think about how the simulated me would be governed via an artificial intelligence, and the me in base reality is governed by Newtonian laws of physics, right? And just my own, you know, organic computer sitting between my ears <laughs> in, in, my, in my head. Um, what's going to happen is the simulated me is going to learn and grow at a rate that's different from the real me in base reality. And I think that is going to happen first. So we're going to create avatars. And those avatars are going to be integrated and interacting with an artificial intelligence. So basically, two computers, two computer programs interfacing with each other. Um, they're going to learn at dramatically faster rate than I can biologically learn, and thusly, they're going to they're going to grow and just evolve at dramatically faster rate than I can do because of my own limitations of my own biology. I think that's going to happen first. But when we quote unquote jack in to the matrix or the metaverse, 
Um, first of all, I don't think we're going to do it through some plug in our, in our brain. I think what's going to happen is we will popularize and standardize uh, Neuralink, so something like Neuralink. It might be Neuralink, it might be something else, but something like Neuralink from Elon Musk. And, but we're not going to physically plug in. We're going to use, I mean, maybe get it right and they also get it wrong. We're going to use like some sort of wireless transmission, super, super ultra fast wireless transmission. Um, that interfaces with that neural link that speeds up our own biological processing power. But I think that we're a ways off from just, just because of like regulatory concerns. I think what's going to happen first is the artificial intelligence will interface with the stimulated me and it's going to help that stimulated me grow in ways that are important to the real me in base reality. So I hope that helps. Cool. Awesome. Thanks. Um, one more question, and I'm gonna, it's going to be mine, I guess, because we have no more from the audience, and we'll open this up. Um, so Matt, you and I are basically the same age, fellow Gen Xer. <laughs> <laughs> what, I've noticed a lot of Gen Xers um, doing things like this, so what is it that compels out people in our age bracket who are now getting to be on the older side to be hanging out here doing things like this? That's a great question, man. Um, <laughs> that's a really good question. Uh, I would say I don't know. I think, I think, gosh, I've never been asked that question, but thank you for making me think deeply about that. I, I would say for me personally, I believe it is um, probably an artifact of when we were born. So like I'm 47 years old. I was born in 1972. That gave me access to the internet, to having an interest in the internet at a time when it was being popularized, not created, because it, it existed for like 30 years before I even knew about it, but popularized. So I had this interest right out of high school about doing something creative with uh, and interesting with a technology that was easily accessible to me, right? And then we had um, all of these, we, we had access to all of this information, and that information actually helped us grow into where we are now. But I will tell you that through, since, gosh, uh, mid, early to mid-1990s, <clears throat> I mean, I have I've witnessed virtual reality come and go exactly four times, right? Uh, we had, like, the, the, the um, Nintendo VR Boy or whatever the, the heck that thing was called. It was, it was horrible, <laughs> horrible monstrosity, but it actually wasn't virtual reality. Um, you know, we, but we had, we had movies like Tron and we had this emergence of all of these really interesting creative endeavors that stimulated our brains and our creativity to want to be a part of that. You know, people want to be part of a like-minded group of individuals. And I would say that that, that kind of helped us get to where we are. The other thing I'll say is that, um, I forget the guy that coined the term Generation X, but, um, I did read, read all of his books, but um, if you haven't read the book Generation X, I would encourage you to do that. But, uh, you know, books like that, access to to a time when uh, it was it was it was encouraged to break the rules, you know, think the grunge movement, you know, that brought me to Seattle, like all of these things, I think, helped encourage us to be where we are today. Nice. I agree. So um, cool. thanks again, Matt. Um, everybody give Matt one last, last round of emoji applause. That was awesome. Awesome. Thanks, and everybody. Really I, appreciate being here. I think you can get on the stage. But if you can't get on the stage, then we'll all group up here and we'll try to get a shot in another way. Sweet. Awesome. Oh, nice. Awesome. Work. So go ahead and gather around. Basically, the camera bots up there, the gray camera bots up in the air up there. And if you're on the gray, if you're on the stage, then you're visible, so you can you don't have to all get in each other's faces or anything. Um, go ahead and give a round of emoji applause for Matt. Whatever you want to do, wave to the camera, etc. Nice. Cool. Awesome. This was really fun, and we totally appreciate you not coming by. So yeah, thanks, feel everybody. free to do 
do as you want here if you want to sit around and talk to people or um, talk to Matt. I don't know how long he's got. We got 11 minutes left on the thing here, but thank you. Yeah, I'm happy to. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, thank, thanks everyone. Thanks, John. Thank you. I'm happy to hang out and answer questions if anybody has it.